Amasua, Amayuya, Amakeya. Do not steal, do not lie, do not be lazy. My grandmother whispered these words to me in Quechua when I was a little kid and I was trying to fall asleep at her house. She was telling me stories of growing up in the Andes in Peru. She was telling me words of wisdom that her mother used to tell her in Quechua. Amasua, Amayuya, Amakeya. That was the only time in my entire life that I heard my grandmother speak Quechua to me. Quechua is an indigenous language spoken in South America, mostly in the Andes. It's still spoken by over 8 million people today. It has many different varieties, and some of them are fading away. But luckily, the language is still strong and vibrant. And today, if I want to reclaim my ancestry and connect with Quechua, I can go online and take Quechua language courses. I want to tell you a little bit about my family's story through the lens of languages, so you can see how our identities shifted over time. And looking at language is a nice way to look at cultural complexity beneath the surface. And in telling you all of this, I want to show you how I became attuned to linguistic diversity and why I decided to devote my life to documenting endangered languages. So my grandmother grew up speaking Quechua as her native tongue in the Andes in Peru. But she abandoned it around the age of 16 when she moved to Lima, the capital city of Peru. There she worked as a seamstress and a nanny. And she eventually met my grandfather. They got married and they had four kids. That's my mom in the center back row. My mom and her siblings grew up speaking Spanish. They did not learn Quechua. Spanish, also known as Castellano, the language of the conquistadors, brought from Spain by the invaders just like other languages were brought from Europe to the Americas, English, French, Portuguese. My mother immigrated to Canada in the late 1970s, and there she met my father, who was French Canadian. My father learned Spanish. As soon as he met her, he went and learned Spanish so he could communicate with her. And they soon got married, and my mother worked really hard to learn French and English. So my brother and I were very lucky to grow up surrounded by multiple languages. But on my father's side, we also lost another language, Breton. Breton is a Celtic language spoken in northwestern France. And my great-grandfather uh, spoke this language, but he never passed the skill down to his descendants. When he immigrated from France, to Canada, he started speaking mostly French and English, the colonial languages of Canada. And so today, Breton, unfortunately, is a highly endangered language. There's only a few speakers left. Um, and it, it might become extinct in this current generation, unless we do something to save it. And I often wondered growing up, why did we learn, why, do, why did my family lose these languages? And why did we not talk about them very often around the dinner table? I never understood the answers to those questions until later on. But growing up in a multilingual context was very beneficial because I had the chance to jump back and forth between different worlds that languages conjure up. When you're speaking different languages, you feel them in your body. It feels like home. My brother and I grew up speaking English and French with our friends and at school, and we spoke Spanish at home. And it wasn't until later in life that I learned a startling statistic. There are over 7,000 human languages in the world. 
and nearly half of them are in danger of disappearing this century. Think about that. That's over 3,000 languages on Earth that are fading away. And why? Because of the impacts of cultural assimilation, because of the long-term impacts of colonization, and in some places, the long-term impacts of nationalist policies that try to stamp out diversity in favor of people being more homogenous. When I learned all of this, everything kind of stopped for me and reframed itself slowly. I realized that the languages I grew up loving and appreciating were kind of deadly. They were erasing smaller minority languages around the world. And I wanted to know what could I do to help preserve linguistic diversity. So I decided to devote my life to documenting endangered languages and working in communities where people are struggling to keep their languages alive. Here I am in Paraguay, working with two speakers, Ige and Carmen Picanerai, documenting the Ayoreo language. So I've been doing this kind of work for close to 10 years, and I've been working with Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages. Um, we're a research nonprofit, and what we do is we work in places where languages are not being transmitted to younger generations. And so we work on documentation, creating online dictionaries. We work on training language activists to get the training and equipment and skills they need to preserve their languages in the long term. And in doing this kind of work, I've had the opportunity to meet amazing people and experience so many unique contours and peaks and valleys of so many different languages. And I'm really grateful to do this work. One of the languages that I worked on the most is called Yanisha. Yanisha is spoken on the eastern slopes of the Andes, where the Andes become the Amazon in Peru. And I wanted to work there because of my cultural connection to Peru. And I wanted to learn about more indigenous cultures in Peru. The person I worked with the most was Espiritu Bautista. He was a Yanisha cultural expert. He was a storyteller, a musician, an educator, a cultural liaison, and an archivist. And one of the things that Espiritu spent a good portion of his life doing was interviewing elders in all the different Yanisha communities. And he recorded hundreds of hours on cassette tapes, hundreds of hours of epic narratives and personal stories and songs and dialogues. And one of my jobs working on the project with him was to digitize all of these cassette tapes. And so I spent a lot of time listening to recordings of the language. And I realized that these stories and songs preserved in the tapes represent a huge tapestry of knowledge that is interconnected and interwoven with the natural world. Really, every time I would ask him a question, like, what does this lyric mean or what is this story about? It was like pulling on a little tendril of something and having the whole universe fall out. <laughs> All, the whole universe with everything in it. Here are a couple highlights from Espiritu's collection. Rartsoret, Yuka's song. This song originates from our mother Yuka, the cassava root. We sing this song when we plant Yuka so that high quality Yukas will grow. That song shows the relationship, the kinship relationship that the Yanisha have with the plants and the species around them, and how they sing them into being so they nourish them. Another story, Yachor Paya, our mother Paya. This is the story of our mother Paya, wife of the Inca. She brought us cotton, which was woven by our sister Spider Woman, so we could have our traditional robes, the kushma. This is what the traditional robes look like for women, the kushma. They are hand-woven textiles made of cotton with beautiful intricate designs and beadwork made from natural items. 
And in, in doing this work with Espiritu 2 over the years, I realized several important things about the Yanisha language and culture that I want to share with you today. So I was interested in women's experiences and women's songs and lyrics. And I studied the puberty ritual that they have. It's an ancient ritual that goes back thousands of years, and it has parallels in many other native cultures in the Americas as well. When a young woman hits puberty for the first time, she's enclosed in a small hut. And when she's inside that hut, usually for one or two or three months, depending, she kind of goes through like a life skills boot camp in which she's taught all of these traditional knowledge, um, such as weaving textiles, learning patterns, learning about traditional plant medicine, making different brews. And if she's part of a song keeping lineage, she also learns how to sing. She learns beautiful, long, complex verses from these songs that have been passed down from generation to generation. And when the young woman is inside the hut, she painstakingly learns all of these <laughs> different skills and she learns how to sing. And in those lyrics that she's learning, so much ecological knowledge is encoded and celebrated in those lyrics. And this is a picture that was taken during one of the celebrations that followed the ritual. So when the woman comes out of the enclosure, there's a big community celebration um, and, many, and many fun fun dancing, <laughs> lots of fun dancing happens. And so this is one of the pictures I took at one of the celebrations I attended. In studying all of this about Yanisha culture and language, I realized that in documenting Yanisha, we are not just saving vocabulary and grammar, we're saving a museum of the mind, a large collection of interwoven types of knowledge. And it's all related to their landscape, too. All of the stories and epic narratives and songs are specifically tied to specific mountains and rivers and valleys and ancestral mythical figures that had daring adventures throughout all of these places. And I realized that when you speak Yanisha and learn about Yanisha oral history, the landscape becomes alive and animated and everything is manifested in the language. One of my favorite things about my job is when I learn words that make my brain explode a little bit. So for example, another language that I worked on a lot is called Ishir, also known as Chamacoco, spoken in Paraguay. In the Ishir language, there is a really interesting word. It's utusht, utusht. Utusht means root of a plant or a tree, but it also means vein of a person or an animal. I thought this was such an interesting word because in English, we need two separate words to convey those concepts. Root is different than vein, and thus we have two different words. But in the Ishir culture, it's one and the same. And I think it's because they live in a very dry and arid environment. And finding sources of water is a really important part of daily life. And as the picture shows, as the artwork shows, they tap different trees and different plants to get moisture to survive. So maybe they see the lifeblood circulating in these plants the same way they see the lifeblood circulating inside our bodies. I realized in working with Ishir, that learning their language was kind of like stepping into a vehicle that takes you somewhere, allows you to navigate the world in a different way. The person I worked with the most is named Andres Osuna. Andres is a local indigenous Ishir leader. Uh, he's a writer, he's published books in his language, and we worked for many years together to produce a dictionary of Ishir, bilingual with Spanish. And in working with Andres, I saw how hard and how, how hard he worked and how resilient he was to reclaim not only his language, but his territory. He recently 
um, with his community, after many years, won an important legal battle to reclaim traditional lands. And land and language are intricately connected. I connect people to their, to their place where they reside and they learn about the world. And just a few weeks ago during the pandemic, he actually published this dictionary that we've been working on for many years. And Andres hand delivered it to many different community members. There's about 500 speakers left of this language. And he went from community to community to bring the dictionaries to people so they could celebrate it in small little gatherings rather than a big launch to be safe. In working on this project, I've really understood that the language is the way that shared knowledge can be woven from the past to the present to the future. It might surprise you to know that language revitalization is also happening here in North Carolina. At the time of colonial contact, it's estimated that there were about 25 languages spoken here in North Carolina, but many of them have unfortunately disappeared or were actively repressed through genocide and cultural assimilation and displacement. But several languages remain and are still vibrant today, such as Cherokee and Tuscarora and others. And in Hollister, North Carolina, um, in the Halawasaponi Indian tribe, there are people working hard to reclaim the Tutelo Saponi language. And so using documents and archives and recordings and linguistic analysis, Marvin Richardson and Matthew Richardson have been able to revive the Tutelo Saponi language, even though the last fluent speaker passed away decades ago. And it's a great honor to work with them on their very first online living dictionary for Tutelo Saponi, so that younger community members can access the language and have a presence for it on the internet. I want to leave you with a couple of closing thoughts about how you can work towards promoting linguistic diversity in your everyday life. Number one, look at your own region. Are there any languages that went extinct where you live? Are there any languages that are still endangered? And can you show support for them? Number two, look at your own ancestry. Are there languages that were lost? Do you want to reclaim them? Maybe learn some poems or songs? Go online, see who else is speaking these languages? And number three, when you hear a language you don't understand, don't approach it with resentment or hostility or guilt. Approach it with curiosity and compassion. When you hear other languages, listen with love and not fear. Thank you.